yeah. I love my HBCU. And boy, I love it, love it. I love it, love it. I love my HBCU. And man, I hope my team they won one. I hope my team they won one. Yeah, man. I hope my team they won one. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, she tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talk. they know what they be talking about. Yeah. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they won a loss. Yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to this is Dr. Lil with Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Welcome to episode 413 of Inside the HBCU Sports Lab radio show and podcast. The show is covering the sporting HBCU dash for all things HBCU sports for institutions large and small. From NIA to the NCAA, we share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture, HBCU athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs in the business of HBC sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, along with my co-hosts, Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Mike Washington is out on assignment, but none other than Charles is here. We're filming from our home studio and sending a signal live to Case Waste Store 30 AM Studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer, Ralph Cooper, in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. Charles, how are you doing today? Doing well, Doc, doing well. I tell you what, our uh, host springs eternal. Uh, when we're taking a look at these season previews as we head into uh, various media days, CIAA Media Day today and uh, MIAG Media Day tomorrow, SWAC is next week. Uh, Doc, I even picked up my copy of Dave Campbell's football magazine, which you know here in Texas, that's the Bible. So uh, we're right around the corner from football season. Yeah, you know, with the CIAA uh, second segment, third segment, we're scheduled to have Dr. Foster, Winston-Salem State alumni undergrad, uh, did his doctorate at Texas A&M, but now he's currently at the University of Kansas. Does mm -hmm. a lot of research on HBCU, so we're going to share one of his last research projects that really excited me, among with a lot of his other works. We're going to get a chance to uh, talk about that a little bit, but uh, before we get into that, I wanted to talk about the fact that I got to visit uh, Elizabeth City State. I'm down here in Dr. Banks. Parade Banks uh, does a lot of work with the MEAC, obviously with Norfolk State, where he's a professor. Uh, many uh, knives, if you would, many tools in his sheds in terms of what he gets done. Faculty athletic represents far as many people know about it. Also recently elected to his uh, department as the chair, negotiating all that parts of it. So that's another story. But he took me out last night. Had to get a chance to go down to Elizabeth City, where he's from, visit Elizabeth City State University, and somebody obviously uh, that is alumni there graduated there. So I got to see the insight, the old and the new. Walked in the gym, got a chance to talk with the AD, the coach, women's basketball coach that won the championship. Got to talk with her, got some pictures. So I was all in it. Hall of Fame, really nice uh, opportunity to see that. So I wanted to shout out uh, Dr. Banks and all those. Elizabeth City State fans, alumni, and supporters. With that being said, Charles, what, what you got in terms of CIAA? What's the news in the landscape? Sure, well, let's take a look at it. The Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association unveiled their 2023 all CIAA preseason football team as voted by the CIAA football coaches and sports information directors. And the predicted order of finish as selected by the head football coaches. So let's take a look at that. Uh, first, we start off. Uh, by the 2023 team features 18 returning players uh, from the 2022 all CIAA team, including seven first teamers led by CIAA leading rusher Jada Byers of Virginia Union and the CIAA offensive rookie of the year, Isaiah Freeman. So let's take a look at the predicted order of finish. Uh, Fayetteville State and Bowie State are predicted to uh, represent of uh, the, the South and the Northern Divisions, respectively. Uh, coming in at three is Virginia Union, four, Shaw. Virginia State is five, Johnson C. Smith at six, Winston-Salem State at seven, Elizabeth City State eight, Bluefield State uh, nine, Lincoln 
Pennsylvania at 10, Livingstone 11, and St. Augustine comes in at 12. So that's a predicted order of finish in the CIAA. Good stuff, good stuff. Hey, uh, as I was riding back with uh, Dr. Banks uh, to get ready and prep for the show, I was got a chance to talk to Lynn Thompson as uh, he's doing his work and um, get a chance to probably you know, sit down and have dinner with both of them. I'm going to get an insight, but, man, they're putting in some work. They're doing some things down here in the MEAC, uh, quietly moving the muscle, getting things done. Uh, it's been exciteful again to be up here in the MEAC territory. And I tell you what, these MEAC folks, you know, we, we do our thing. I'm from the SWAC, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but when you come up there, you know, we always talk about the hospitality we have in this SWAC in the South, S-I-E-C, uh, but it does not – uh, defeat the purpose up here in the MEAC. They take care of you. That's all right. They respect that's what you're what doing. You they take care of you. So that, that's all you can have, which is, end of the day, what we talk about the HBC Sporting Dash. Talking about the Sporting Dash, you know, we have these independent programs uh, in terms of Tennessee State and OVC, and most recently over the last couple of years, Hampton, and what is now known formally as the Colonial Athletic Association. Mm -hmm. um, they have changed their name uh, in terms of that. So that's going to be interesting when you talk about the CAC. What are your thoughts on that, Charles? Uh, pretty smart uh, branding opportunity to, uh, uh, now that you have a couple of HBCUs within the ranks, to uh, sort of uh, rebrand the conference, expand uh, uh, that uh, geographic footprint, if you will, and and now uh, they are no longer the Colonia Athletic Association. So uh, now they are the Coastal Athletic Association. So keep the CAA, but uh, a little change from the Colonia there. Pretty smart. Coastal Athletic Association or the Coastal Athletic Conference. Uh, pretty smooth in terms of the name they chose. So you keep part of the brand, uh, to be fair and upfront with that, um, the CAA. I think uh, ESPN had the CAC in terms of Coastal Athletic Conference, but to my understanding is still Coastal Athletic Association uh, in terms of CAA. So get that out there. As you said, uh, it's tough in these modern times uh, to be using Colonial uh, out there mm. in terms of your signature name. So credit to them in terms of making the change. What better time as you diversify uh, your program institutions, particularly when we talk about in this framework, historically white colleges, which they all house, but now two HBCU. So fascinating. Good move. We'll see what that means as we move forward. With that, I'm going to chop it back up to you, Charles. What else you have on your menu in terms that has you excited uh, this time of the year in terms of athletic news out there? Yeah, well, Alabama State uh, basketball player was named Sweat woman of the year. So let's get into that. Uh, the Southwestern Athletic Conference has named Alabama State basketball player Ayanna Manuel as the SWAC woman of the year. Uh, last season, Emmanuel uh, was the leading scorer in the league during conference play. She averaged 16.9 points per game in league action. Her stellar play helped propel Alabama State to a 12-6 and six mark in conference play. For her efforts, she was named 2022-2023 SWAC woman of the year. So kudos to Yana Emanuel uh, for capturing this award here in the SWAT. Good stuff, good stuff. Uh, good information in terms of what you got there. With that, we're going to go into our break. I know there's some good things out there. Maybe we'll get a chance to talk about it on the back end of the show and get your, your thoughts on some of the additional news, uh, where things are heading. But with that being said, let's get into our first break. We'll come back on the other side. Now we'll bring Dr. Foster, say beyond Foster, into the fold and see what his thoughts and how he is going to talk about it. I guess we'll get a chance to ask him, you know, first of all, before we get too far into it, what is his thoughts of Winston-Salem State being selected seventh overall, if I'm not correct, if, if I am correct in terms of overall ranking and fourth in the Southern Division. You know, we got to ask him a little about his thoughts on that. But stay tuned. We'll be right back after this first break. Stride K-12 powered schools are ready to put over 20 years of being a leader in online education to work for you. Dive into curriculum design for the online classroom. Team up with state certified teachers nice. trained in virtual instruction. Take control of your child's education journey. Discover the power.
power of personalized learning with a leader experienced in preparing kids for a future they can be excited about. Take charge. Stride K-12. Enroll now for the fall. Stride K-12 powered schools are ready to put over 20 years of being a leader in online education to work for you. Dive into curriculum design for the online classroom. Team up with state certified teachers nice. trained in virtual instruction. Take control of your child's education journey. Discover the power of personalized learning with a leader experienced in preparing kids for a future they can be excited about. Take charge. Stride K-12. Enroll now for the fall. The human voice has always connected audiences with experiences. Major brands all across America have trusted Kevers Voice time and time again. Conversational, powerhouse, intelligent, and sincere. That's the voice you need for your creative marketing process. K E A V E R S V O I C E dot com. Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice dot com. Always on, all the time. Press the analytic data with your hip hop If you know them like I know them They gon' tell you if your team If they wanna love ya And who the ball, who the ball So listen to Professor Yes sir, yes sir And pay attention Cause he gon' teach a lesson Make sure This is Dr. Ville with Inside the HBC Sports Lab With Mike Washington and Charles Bishop As we said, Mike Washington is out on assignment I don't know. I think he's throwing some curveballs, getting some things done, but he says he's working. But uh, Savon, I'm not sure about that. He kind of disappears. But oh, man, what's amazing to me, he always, first of the month, he makes sure that this <laughs> hands out there. I just, I, I don't, I don't get this, man. But I guess, you know, when you're the faculty, you just kind of come and go, you know. Oh, if you yeah, ain't on the administrative side, you just slip and slide. Down. You know what it is. Some folks like yourself. Dr. Foster, uh, Charles, you see what we do. You can relate clinical Very professor. Much so. you, you're getting around here in adjunct status uh, as he works towards his doctor. But let me do this correct. Savon Foster, PhD, is an assistant professor who joined KU. That's uh, Kansas Univer University of Kansas, for those that don't know, sport management faculty in fall of 2022. Prior to joining the faculty at Kansas, Dr. Foster worked across multiple sectors, Across the sport industry and the higher education, his experiences range from equipment management, facility operations, sports retail, and fan services. To note, he served as an admission counselor and career preparation counselor at the University of Pittsburgh, as well as marketing intern and equipment game day operations personnel for Florida A&M University and Winston-Salem State University, respectively. Don't let him fool you. He is a researcher. He is getting it done often and early. I like to see that research one institution, AAU as well. So, you know, they don't just take anybody there. So he's getting it done. Dr. Foster has published scholarships in journals across the field, such as Sociology of Sport Journal, Journal Issues in the Intercollegiate Athletics, Innovative Higher Education, and the Journal of Athletic Development Experience. He has also presented research in multiple national, international, if you would, conferences notable, the North American Society of Sports Management and the College Sports Research Institute, uh, where I've come across and met him a couple of times, uh, as well as going back to Texas A&M uh, when I was trying to get into Texas Southern University coming out there, but we weren't ready for that. Um, so uh, he took his talent somewhere else. Hopefully, as we move forward before he falls in love with that money, maybe we can get him back. Uh, in at Texas Southern, or at least in the HBC sphere, but uh, he's on the climb, so we have to see what that looks like. But we'll talk about some of his research in a minute. With that being said, welcome to the show, Dr. Foster. Thank you, Dr. Cavill. It's a, it's an honor to be on. You know, me and you, we always have a good relationship. We always chop it up good, so I'm glad to be able to contribute. Man, our pleasure. I see you representing uh, Omega Psi Phi. Yes, you know, sir. Yes, these sir. are Alpha brothers on this side, so we're gonna let you make Charles tell it. Yes, today we're gonna we, we, we will extend the the, the brotherly arms uh, to you today. <laughs> oh man, I appreciate it. You know, I got, <laughs> the good brothers. You know, you know they 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 brought me in, took care of me once I got the KC. So any chance I get to represent, oh, nice. we do so. That's what it's about. That's what mm -hmm. I want to hear. Good stuff. Good stuff. 
Uh, with that being said, before we again get a little more into this research, just have a little fun. We're gonna allow folks to tell you where you're actually from, uh, yeah. where you went to undergrad, and a little bit about your academic experience. But uh, as we say this, we open up the show talking about CIAA Media Day. Yeah. You know they have once from Salem State seventh overall and fourth in the Southern Division. What are your thoughts on that? Man, so one of the things I love about Winston is, you know, we we don't let the rankings get to us. Uh, you know, clearly our clearly our basketball team, you know, we we jumped up, we stepped up, catch people, we caught people off guard. We won a CIAA, I believe, like two years ago. You know, a lot of folks counted us out, but we did what we needed to do. And you know, when it comes to Winston football, I came in when we won the CIAA in 2012. So, you know, mm-hmm. I, I was there, I was there during a the great period for Winston and you know. Again, we you know we, we smack a couple teams in the mouth, and you know, pretty much we start we start rolling, and everyone else is gonna have to worry about us. So you know, I'm feeling good. Rank seven, rank fourth, you know, in the division, that's nothing. I like that. You know, he slid a little basketball in there. I know. Yeah, y'all won it last year. Won the tournament. I, I understand. Yeah. He's like we a basketball school. <laughs> oh, we basketball. We play Kansas basketball as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, with, with Winston, you you never know. Like, any team has the opportunity to come up and shock a little bit of everybody. So, you know, you know we're doing good. Charles, you want to get in here with any update before I ask him where he's from and let him share that with the people? Well, I was curious, about, like, what was your experience uh, at, like at Winston State? So, uh, for me, I was an out-of-state student. I wasn't from the region. So, I'm, I'm okay. a, originally from the Midwest, but mm-hmm. uh, my family's from the deep south of Mississippi. So, being out like being out in North Carolina wasn't a shock to me, but you know it was great to be down there, being a state that has multiple HBCUs, a culture that's pretty prevalent. Um, so you know being able to not just be in Winston Salem and see Winston grads, but seeing A and T grads, Shaw grads, people who just went to HBCUs, and you know how within our community we'll talk trash while we're in school, but at the end of the day we support all HBCUs. So it's pretty sure. cool to be in such a big state and be able to have that. Uh, academically, I had a great experience. I was a sport management major in undergrad. Um, our program coordinator, he's, he's a legend. He's a living legend, at least, Dr. Dennis Felder. And, um, you know, they just created a great experience for me. Um, academically, socially, professionally, like I just had a great time. So, you know, no regrets. What part of Mississippi are you people from? Meridian, Mississippi. Oh, no. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Man, so you good. you good. you good now <laughs> if you don't know he's from Mississippi. Oh yeah, yeah. If you don't run across Mississippi folks, it's just like we immediately click. That's what it is. Yeah, that's real talk. That's real talk. But all kidding aside, uh uh Professor Bishop is uh really on top of it. Good, good person, good person. With that being said, you said the Midwest, but where are you from? So I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio. So uh, I grew up dead smack middle of Columbus, maybe about 10 minutes or so away from Ohio State. So growing up, all I really knew was OSU for a long time. I mean, if you're from Columbus, that's basically all you know. So uh, I didn't really get exposed to HBCUs until right before I got into high school. And I got to see something drastically different than, you know, like OSU's campus, like the Ohio Dominicans and other schools that were in the Columbus area. But again, Ohio only has two HBCUs, and both of them were at least an hour away. So Really didn't have that that deep level exposure, which is why being in North Carolina meant so much. You know, being able to be around so many schools. I mean, just between you had Winston, Livingstone, St. Aug, um, A and T, just all of these schools within an hour, hour and a half. And it's just like, man, I can go to any campus and see people that are at similar institutions having the same experience. So I think for me, that's what I was looking for. And then once I got the opportunity, I just dove head first. My little sister did the same thing. She went to, she just graduated from Livingstone. So, you know, we we're starting a tradition in the family where going to an HBCU is a, is is a, is a thing. So, I have two little cousins that are graduating soon. So, I'm already in their ear like, "Hey, if you want to go to Winston, you can do so." But also, I live in KC, so if you want to go to Lincoln, you're like 2 hours away. I can look out for you. You can come crash at the crib, you know, do those types of things. I like it. Mm-hmm. That's that's what's up. With that being said, um you talked about the culture and connectiveness and North Carolina with all the HBCUs among Alabama. You have a lot of HBCUs in the area, particularly when you go between the public and private, uh, uh, most out there. And it's fascinating because when you're in that region, just how close folks are with the states. And you see that with the CIAA basketball tournament 
how they talk about that, how that is like a collective homecoming for all the institutions. Oh, yeah. And definitely. so when we talking with Jay Walker, who was here earlier before we got out, and I was he's asking where you're going because we were supposed to connect this evening too. Yeah. to kind of do a little bit of homework, relax before we get into everything tomorrow. But to shout out to Dr. Banks and, and shout out to Lynn Thompson as they are members of Kappa Alpha Psi. And obviously you got Roy in the background, Phi Beta Sigma. Uh, and so it's unique when you talk about that culture and how, yeah, you have your fraternity along with the sororities. But when you get out to it, that brotherhood that exists on your campus and how all those work together is fascinating. Because we took a ride literally 40 minutes away, 35 miles away. and you're in the next state, and you're at Elizabeth City State. Um, mm-hmm. And so Jay Walker's like, man, where you go? How? That's, you know, okay, that's hours away. I said, no. He said, 40, I'm 45. I don't know. So he asked me, and Lynn said, yeah, that's about 35 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, like, that was, that was something that was a culture shock to me, just being in North Carolina. People would pull up. Like, you know, freshman year was a little tough. We didn't have cars. But, you know, the moment we started having cars on campus, it's like, all right, we got to go to Livingstone. We're going to go to St. Aug. We're going to go down to Charlotte, kick it at Johnson C. Smith. And it was one of those things that, you know, we would go on campus. We would wear our gear. So, you know, we'll have on Winston gear, stuff like that. We're going to a game. And it's just like a deeper level of, like, family. Like, it's almost like every game is like a family reunion or, you know, mm. you're kicking it with folks, you know, like, it's almost like you're back home. And, you know, that's something that I appreciate. And even now. You know, when I've traveled around, I've gone to Prairie View. You know, I've been able to hang out on their campus and feel, you know, right at home. Been able to do the same thing, Texas Southern. Um, And then even now, I've gone down to uh, Lincoln, had a good time, and I'm making plans to go to uh, Langston. There's a lot of KC people that uh, go to Langston that have gone to Langston. Mm -hmm. So that Kansas City connection, you know, me and a couple friends are just going to hop in the car, go down, and just have a good time. So, Again, I feel like you can't do that with every type of institution, but with HBCUs, it's definitely doable. I'm yeah, I, I, right now, before we get in there, and I'll just jump in there. I'm going to throw back a little history. Mm-hmm. There was a, a point in time where Langston and Lincoln, the presidents, happened to both be members of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Mm-hmm. And they were going to make the move. Lincoln was already Division II and moved away from NIA. Langston was going to move from NIA and go to Division II. And they got an invitation to join the SIAC. So there's going to be an extension. They mm-hmm. left their presidency and the new presidents came in, didn't like the idea. So they transitioned back out. But think about how that would have worked in terms of uh, moving forward, how if history would have moved in a different direction, Lincoln and Langston would have been outposts of the SIAC. Yeah, yeah, that, that would have been great. I mean, just <laughs> just thinking about how, I mean, even now, there's a lot of there's a huge KC connection between both of those schools, and you know, just just the people coming in those those games. You know, you have friends from high school and from the neighborhood. Y'all went to different schools. You build in that rivalry from people who are just from that area. It'll be it'll be a nice experience. It would have been a nice experience. Mm. So, Charles, you wanted to jump back in? Yeah, I was saying I can absolutely relate. Uh, going to Jackson State, being kind of centrally located within the swag, but. It was nothing for a weekend trip, especially down in New Orleans, Xavier Dillard and all those schools down there. Or, you know, you go three hours up here, go to Grandma and, you know, or bank it down to Southern. And, uh, of course, a bunch of us will head up to Russ. To, you know, it's, uh, you definitely get that familial aspect there, um, you know, in terms of uh, once you got a car, you couldn't keep you on campus on the weekend. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it, like, it, it's such a different experience, you know. Uh, my little sister, she got her car earlier in her college career than, than than I did. And every time I called her, she was somewhere else. And I'm like, I'm so glad because she was in college during COVID. I'm like, I'm so glad you're getting the experience that I had in college because now she's starting grad school. She's going, she's doing a dual degree program at uh, UNCG in North Carolina A&T in their nice. social program. But she's already going in knowing people. She's in Greensboro. She knows folks, and it's not just folks from Livingstone. It's just the fact that she bounced around and hung out with people and built those relationships. So, you know, I'm just incredibly happy for her. You know, it, again, it's just something unique about our space where we can do that for each other. Mm-hmm. That, that is unique. One of the first things when I moved out, took my first job up there in Huntsville, Alabama, as Charles alluded to, it wasn't anything, uh, a single thought. In Perth, Texas, we do travel, but you're probably going up to Dallas, 
but really the uh, place we travel to in re regards to the HBCU would obviously be Houston to Texas Southern and then Baton Rouge to Southern. But we didn't go really beyond that other than Bayou Classic from New, uh, New Orleans where you got a chance to do them. When I was in Huntsville, it wasn't anything. I was up there in Nashville, Tennessee State, South Carolina, South Carolina State, over there in Mississippi, Jackson State, uh, down to Alabama State. We'd run over there and see the private schools if you want a little more of that. We went into Atlanta. But you're right. To get around Miles College, Tuskegee, and, and it wasn't anything. Three hours, you had your choice of HBCs you wanted to go and see what yes, the sir. thing of the day, whether it's homecoming, some type of spring fest. But like you said, just go uh, visiting um, some brothers if you're in a Greek organization or cousins if you had them in the area. It's another thing that you do. With that, let's get into our first break. We'll come back on the other side and we'll actually get into some of the dialogue that we really wanted to get into in terms of this research. Uh, we get a chance to get into a research paper particularly. I know you got a lot of them. And we'll talk about some for those that are uh, into that and want to go read some of the research. But we're going to take a little bit of time to look at you got to be there. A thematic context analysis of historical black college, university, and sporting experience. And before we end, want to make sure we share the latest research that it looks like you're going to be able to take on that will have you at various homecomings as a little tease coming up this fall. So stick with us. We'll be right back with this break. We'll come back on the other side and we'll have a little more time to talk to Dr. Foster and get in a little bit of this research that our listeners really love because they get into the business side of this. And now they get a chance to move beyond uh, our fandom as it is that time of the year. And we should be excited for football. And we'll take that back to the rifle mantle tomorrow morning as we get into the MEAC after doing the CIAA thing today. And then obviously next week with the SWAC. But before we get inundated with our fandom and who's going to do this and that, we're going to give you a little bit more on the research side and have you understand some of those experiences that we just talked about. Stick with us, be right back after this break. Are you hungry for authentic Caribbean food? Like jerk chicken, oxtail, red snapper, shrimp, tofu, and rasta pasta? Well, find your way over to Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Pika in downtown Atlanta. Them belly full, but we hungry. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, open daily from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. And on Friday and Saturday, we're open till 4 a.m. Come to Mango's and put some spice in your life. Oh, we've got Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Peacock. In downtown Atlanta. For more info or directions, call 404-698-3992. Or log on to mangoscaribbeanrestaurant.com. For instant coupons, text M-A-N-G-O-S to 313131. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant. Authentic Caribbean cuisine. Press the analytic data with your hip hop If you know them like I know them They gon' tell you if your team If they wanna love ya yeah. And who the ball, who the ball So listen to Professor Yes sir, yes And pay attention boy. Cause he gon' teach a lesson yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab With Mike Washington and Charles Bishop We have our visiting guest here today that is none other than Dr. Savon Foster, uh, currently uh, assistant professor at the University of Kansas, but with his roots at Winston-Salem State uh, University in terms of his undergraduate studies. With that, I told you before we left, we're going to talk about uh, one of his research papers that really stood out to me among many. You got to be there. A thematic content analysis of historically black college and university sporting experience. I'm going to keep it salient. I'm just going to read this abstract, and then we'll come in here and have some dialogue about that. To get people understanding the overall framework of this study, the college sports landscape is a unique arena where institutional and social norms merge with erratic but highly traditional sporting space. While the broader scope of college sports is framed through a predominantly white institution, PWIs, you heard it on this show, we tend to talk about it historically white college and universities. The context of differing institutions often forgotten and misunderstood. The process is primarily, primarily evident with minority serving institutions, historically black college and university, HBCUs, or educational spaces 
that leverage the historical foundation of missions in an effort to create safe, equitable space for Black students and community members. Traditionally, scholars inquire about HBCUs that focus primarily on exploring and understanding institutional missions and cultures. The dynamic and complex relationships that exist between HBCUs and their collegiate sporting teams continues to be understudied. This study uses a Black liberatory fantasy lens to analyze tweets posted by HBCU students, alumni, media members from 2013 to 2020. A thematic content analysis of tweets discovered five emergent themes that highlight the unique contributions of HBCU sporting space. One, shifting HBCU narratives. Two, the communal culture of HBCU sports. Three, the HBCU sporting sanctuary. Four, enrichment within the HBCU sporting space. And five, the black oppressive nightmare. Implications of this study highlight institutional and cultural specific approaches towards marketing, fan, and experience, and broader social discourse. My first question to you, Brother Savon, is why did, what made you decide to do the study in this frame? So uh, I guess the primary uh, motivation for this, between growing up in Buckeye country, being at University of Pittsburgh for my master's, and in Texas A&M for my PhD, I got tired of folks looking at HBCUs through such a negative lens. And uh, I notice a lot of people, you know, when you talk about college athletics, depending on the program, only certain programs get the shine, they get the glory. But I feel like it's very limited. Basically, if you're not winning or if you're not in that main, quote unquote, mainstream conversation, uh, you know, you really don't get a lot of shine. And I mean, we can even look at that from a class-based perspective. You know, the way people talk about, quote unquote, mid-majors. There's a lot of mid-major programs that are great. There's a lot of HBCU programs that have historically been great and contemporarily are great. So I wanted to find a way to reposition the way that we talk about HBCUs in a way that we understand it. Because I also believe that our experience when it comes to the athletic realm is significantly different than a historically predominantly white institution. So, you know, you look at, like, I looked at my experience at Texas a and I've been to a football game, been to a basketball game and a baseball game. I've actually been to a couple for all those sports. And it's just... It's very, you know, one level. It's like you're there, you're at an Aggie baseball game, you know, you have a couple traditions. Or you go to a Pitt football game, and, you know, I love my time at Pitt, but even when you have a university that's playing in the Steelers stadium, you lose a little bit of that, a little bit of that identity. But, you know, when you – I'm looking back at my time at Winston, it's like, man, game day at Bowman Gray was like a thing. You know, you, we looked forward to that. The community looked forward to it. People would pull up and tailgate and do all these other things. And it's like HBCUs just offer a little bit more. And I think people need to understand what we offer, but then also why we offer it. Charles, did you want to jump in there and follow up? I really yeah, like uh, when you said that about the thematic process. Because uh, I, I was curious, what, uh, and I, when I looked at the abstract implication of study, highlight institutional and cultural approaches uh, towards marketing, fan experience, and broader social discourse. Uh, what do you hope? to sort of uh, uh, gather from your research? I mean, is this uh, research that athletic directors and, and boosters uh, can look at and, and see certain things and that would ha- help, uh, you know, enhance their, their fan experience or their marketing efforts at, at various HBCUs? Oh, definitely. I think, uh, I mean, I can look at my time at Winston, you know, perfectly. Um, and I, I need to get it on record. And But we're pretty confident that we were one of the first schools specifically within the CIAA to have a DJ integrated into our regular game day experience. Mm -hmm. So the music matched what was happening. Um, The fans built off of that. You know, you can look at, you can look at HBCU game day videos and, you know, we'll play chief Keith and then we get hype and then the the away crowd, they get shook up and then you start to see that spread through the CIAA. And then it got to a point to where this was commonplace, you know, the CIAA, they were able to kind of create that experience. I mean, now it's to the point, you know, if you want to get into a Winston basketball game, you, you got to pull up early. If you want to get into any CIAA basketball game, you're pulling up early. You know, it, uh, I think it was my junior year. We had I had a seven o'clock class and I, my professor canceled class early or in class early to make sure that we got to the game because he saw how integral that was to 
the Winston experience as that became a common theme within our um, within our athletic space. But then when you look at like athletic directors, boosters, external folks, I'm really big on intentional marketing and uh, intentional sponsorships and connections. You know, I don't I'm not a fan of organizations just connecting to an HBCU or, to, you know, to to an HBCU because it's like the cool thing to do or the trendy thing to do. I look at the track record of the organization. I look at how they uh, market and how they present to different folks. I know, uh, like, I I use this example in class on how McDonald's, they did the Calvin commercials, trying to cater to the Black community, and Dave Chappelle made a couple jokes about it. But then kind of looking back, looking back at it, it's a very coded and very problematic series of commercials when you look at it through a 2023 context. And it's like, okay, if we're doing NIL deals for athletes, I want a brand, like, like if we're looking at cosmetics, I know uh, cosmetics has been like a big thing, specifically when with the HBCU NIL, NIL deals. It's like, all right, if you're going to partner with HBCU athletes or with an HBCU athletic program, I want to make sure that your track record shows that you've been investing in the Black community and that you understand the importance of your product and how that product is used. So, you know, just those types of things. So, like, people, for the external groups, they can definitely have a more intentional approach. And then for athletic leadership, Sometimes just make sure that they're embedded into the campus community. They know what student they know what students like. They know what community members like, and that they're actually leveraging that and creating and you know amplifying that uh, that element. And you know, there's some schools where the tailgate experience is like bar none. You know, I know PV. Uh, I know Prairie View. They do a great job when it comes to the tailgate and just how they created that that type of experience, that type of environment. And you go on their campus, and it's like the same way that A and M. You have people coming in early and setting up and stuff like that. You see that that's becoming a norm at PV as well. How much does the communal culture of HBCU sport sort of dictate how you market that sport? Uh, and, and I say it from this standpoint, uh, Texas A&M and, and UT, they're rivals. You know, you want to make it uncomfortable if, if the Longhorns come to College Station. But uh, it's, it's uh, to me, it's sort of a unique experience uh, uh, with regards to HBCU sport because it is communal. I mean, I, I, I grew up a Jackson State fan, and, you know, our rival is Southern. But at the end of the day, I, I'm still might invite you in, you know. Uh, so I, I'm curious, how does that change sort of the, the marketing efforts of, of a school? Oh, I mean, for that one, I honestly, I feel like because we have this more familial relationship, the way that we can market, especially now that people are getting more creative on social media, the jabs we can throw at each other, the things that we can do, it doesn't cross a certain line because now it's like, yeah, we're cousins. We're cousins from, you know, different sides of the family or, yeah. you know, like my dad was better at basketball than your dad. And then like, you know, we've kind of just taken on that, that friendly or familial beef with each other. Like at Winston, you know, uh, HBCU game day, some of our social media pages, like students started making like posters and things like that. And they took a picture of a kid, uh, of an athlete who committed to Winston, but then decommitted and went to our rival and they blew it up and then turned it into a poster. And, you know, mm -hmm. I saw that cycling through social media and, you know, with that, you know, it's funny, you know, we laugh about it, things like that. It still brings the hype and the intensity for the rivalry, but, you know, for, a, um, like for a UT and a Texas A&M, you know, it it just doesn't hit the same. You know, you're talking, you're talking trash, you're throwing jabs. But with this one, it's just like, man, you know, when you know a little too much about your cousin, you can really throw some jabs and you know make it uncomfortable. But it's still fun at the same time. But then also, the thing with the communal culture is that everyone feels represented and everyone feels uh, seen within that particular space. So like that, like looking at like an A and M or a UT. Um, while I was there, I felt like everyone, you just had to be an Aggie at the game. Like if mm -hmm. you go to HBCU, if you go to HBCU, you have all the different student clubs and organizations. They come up with chants and stuff like that. That's specific to them at the game. You know, they may have a couple displays. Like I know we had like our modeling troops. They would come down and, you know, they would do a little quick model walk up and down. They would talk <laughs> trash. And then depending on the school, if it was close enough, they would bring their modeling troop. And it was like, yo, we're at a basketball game, but the modeling troops are having, you know, their, their show off. And then, you know, our band and their band and, like, you know, our drum line, their drum, like, it just goes to so much bigger. Like, everyone finds a way to be uh, integrated into that space. And don't let the Greeks get into it because you got one chapter going after another chapter, trying yeah. to see, you know, see who can hop the best, who can stroll the best. Like, and again, that's something like my four years at AM, never saw it. Two years at Pitt, never saw it. But every HBC I've gone to, I've seen that whether it's been in totality or it's like, yo, I catch the modeling troops doing their thing one game. 
one time our our choir started singing like in the middle of, like in the middle of a timeout i'm like yo this doesn't happen anywhere else but at hbc <laughs> I love it. Spontaneous. And you're actually right. That community. It's like playing a dozen in your neighborhood, but yeah. now you're playing dozens between institutions. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. there's a certain way that the rules to in playing the dozens that works, uh, that is not something that people from outside of that framework can do. And exactly. it just is different. Let's go back. That was number two. Let's go to number one. Shifting HBCU narratives. Tell us a little bit about what that's like. So that one, I noticed a lot of people uh, and then, you know, I collected tweets from a pretty decent time frame. So I think I collected tweets from almost a 10 year period. Yeah. So 2013 also, to 2020. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So this was basically going through um, pre Dion, during Dion, and uh, excuse me, just seeing how people kind of framed HBCUs, how they were framed in the mainstream before. That's pretty cool. So a lot of folks are talking like, hey, you know, this is the best bas- best college basketball game I went to. These football games are some of the best games I've gone to. The Bayou Classic is better than, you know, some of these championship games. And you have folks that, you know, they lived in Atlanta. They lived in areas where they post the college football playoffs. And it's like, yeah, you know, that has the hype and everything around it. But nothing's touching the Bayou Classic. Nothing's touching. So, like, Winston, we went to the Cleveland Classic. We played Morehouse one year. And for two schools that aren't in Ohio to drive up to Cleveland, you just have a bunch of HBCU folks just all in Cleveland kicking it, whether it's in a casino or just out and about, just all in that in, in that entire area. Then we were at the Cleveland Brown Stadium, like for that, like again, we started doing these things where it's like you know you have the turnout, you have the vendors, you have the people showing up, and it's like you don't have to go to a OSU, to a OSU versus Michigan or a game like that to have a great experience. But then also a lot of people devalue HBCU athletic talent. And it's like, clearly we see the talent. There were a lot of tweets about Tariq Cohen. There are a lot of uh, tweets about Jackson State and Grambling and Southern East historic HBCUs that we wouldn't have the NFL, NBA, any of these major leagues if it weren't for HBCU athletes coming in and building a foundation. And even now, still contributing to the talent within the league. Just uh, so five emerging themes. We've won over one, shifting, shifting HBCU narratives. Two. That Charles asked about that communal culture of HBCU sports. Let's get on to this third one: the sporting, the HBCU sporting sanctuary. Yeah. So, um, and a lot of this, um, a lot of this pull from other people's experiences. They were just saying that you know, being able to go to the game, be with their friends once they're once they're part of certain organizations, how they can still go in and have their identity, have their reputation while still cheering on their team. Or, you know, even the athletes being a part of it. So, you know, you go to most of most of these power five PWIs, many athletes are just athletes. They don't really have the freedom or opportunity. The research backs it that they don't have the freedom or opportunity to join mm-hmm. clubs or organizations, be something more than just an athlete in, this, in a student in the classroom. So here it's like, man, you know, you get you got an alpha on a basketball team. And, you know, he dunk. It's not just a basketball player dunking. It's an alpha dunking. And, you know, maybe he's an engineering major. And, you know, you got you got the Nesby, you got the Nesby crew getting the hype. So it's again, it's you there's more levels to our athletes and there's more levels to our coaches, more levels to our staff. Like and then once you're able to see that in that sporting space, that makes a closer connection to you. And I mean, during the off season at Winston, we would have our football players, you know, be in some of the modeling shows and stuff. You know, I have like the big buff dudes and stuff like that as part of their, you know, modeling troop, you know, shows and things like that. And it's like. At a and I don't think too many of our athletes got called to do other things. At Pitt, I don't think too many of the athletes got called to do other things. And, you know, you go to HBCU, they're kind of – they're a little bit everywhere. You know, if they have the personality they want to be out and about, you're going to you're gonna know them. You're going to – like, you're going to have that connection with them. It makes me think before we go into thematic number four and five, four is one of my uh, ones that I really appreciated and have some connection to, and I want the people to really understand that. But, you know, we've talked about the sporting identity, Charles, and Savon. Um, it would be interesting to see if we could somehow pull a study together to kind of look at that athletic identity between those that are at HBCUs and those at historically white colleges. Um, because a lot of times that is a problem when you talk about, you know, your athletic identity, um, mm-hmm. particular for Black African American, whichever term you want to do, those athletes and athletes in general, to be fair. But I wonder how unique that is uh, to the HBCU space because 
you're allowed in a lot of ways to have multiple identities, even if you play a sport, baseball, basketball. As you said, a perfect example, uh, when a basketball player dunks, um, people throughout that arena that look like him see his identity multiple ways mm. because of their association with him. Whether, yes. like you said, he's an engineer, so they all in Nesby, or he happens to be a part of a Greek organization, or he is a part of a certain major, uh, and what that looks like uh, from a cultural lens. Uh, maybe he also is part of a band. Uh, uh, fraternity or just the band member in itself or the choir if you uh, localize that in many different ways and that's just a few off the top of the head so great framework when you talk about having a HBCU sporting sanctuary and how that really looks. Number four though you got into enriching within the HBCU sporting space yeah. you know obviously someone like Charles, Mike and I as we do our shows and we come up with these terms to coin it in different ways. I really got excited when I came up and heard about this thematic in terms of HBG sporting space. And I've heard it in different areas and you talk about the paper and we don't necessarily get into that, but at least give us a framework of this enrichment. And I think people will understand why it resonated so much with me. Yeah, of course. So, um, I mean, like in other research, it shows that, you know, HBCU athletes feel like they can do more. They have more academic maturation, more career preparation. They feel more socially embedded in campus. The research shows it, but this one, again, I'm looking at tweets. So I'm looking at what athletes are saying. I'm looking at what coaches are saying. I'm looking at what their classmates and colleagues and people who just attended the institution maybe years before or years after. They're saying like, hey, you know, my coach played football here. He took all of the lessons he learned from, you know, Jackson State or Alcorn, and he integrated that into our high school team. And, you know, like being able to see how you're able to do so much more. It's not just like you're here to play, you know, you're here to play a sport. So we understand that's a responsibility you have. But, you know, we want you to be embedded on campus. We want you to still know your professors. We want you to be able to kind of move and navigate through this space. And just seeing how that's a consistent theme across institution and across time. So, again, from 2013 to 2022, you know, uh, 2013, 2020, you have a huge collection of tweets and they're like, yeah, you know, you know, if you want the total package, if you want to learn, if you want to be part of campus, if you want to, you know, be bigger and better than, you know, who you imagined yourself, how you imagined yourself it could be. And I mean, I think it's it's really unique getting that narrative or getting, you know, those tweets and those statements from people who weren't athletes. They're like, yeah, you know, basketball player in my class was like one of the best students. You know, those types of things to where, you know, if you go and you look at some of the other institutions or how athletes have been framed at other institutions, it's like, oh, you know, he's not a good student, the whole dumb jock narrative. And the fact that, you know, that really wasn't a thing that I found within the tweets. It's like everything that I did see that fell within that theme kind of celebrated athletes and celebrated coaches who valued, valued these things. We even had parents who were HBCU grads talking about how they – appreciated the HBCU coach talking about grad school and next steps and, you know, being a GA, depending on what program they wanted to do in the relationships they had. And it's like, not saying that doesn't happen to other institutions, but I, I, that stands out when you have an HBCU coach talking to an HBCU grad as a parent, trying to recruit an athlete. And they're like, Hey, these are the things that you can do. These are the things that I'm expecting you to do because of what we offer in our program. You know, you can't like, like that's bar none. You can't, you can't top that. Did the, yeah, that's good stuff. Let me ask a quick question, uh, Doc. Uh, did the research sure. uh, dictate or did it change from uh, HBCUs that were on the Division One level uh, to HBCUs that were on the Division Two level, or or were they kind of was the research similar uh, across the board? Actually, it was pretty similar across the board. So uh, again, I had tweets from people across the generations who were on social media talking about their time at HBCUs, and even currently, uh, we've had. A lot of D1s, a lot of D2s. Um, and it, it, it was it was welcoming to see how consistent it was. That, you mm -hmm. know, it's not a particular reason, region. It's not a particular uh, age group. It's like, hey, if you're an HBCU, you're going to get these experiences. And I really appreciated the parents who are on social media, the older alumni who are on social media who may have graduated early 2000s, 90s, or 80s. And they're saying like, hey, you know, what I experienced in 1985 with this football coach, this tradition has continued, you know, moving forward. 
or, you know, just the the reinvestment, how, you know, you get, I think it was a former lineman for Southern. He talked about how he just goes back. And he just talks to the athletes. He talks to all the linemen. Like, it's just something that he wanted to do. And it's like, man, you can't, you, like, those types of things, <laughs> no, those, those types can't. of things are amazing. Want to, want to hold you on just one final segment. We'll take a break, yeah. come back, and get into the fifth one, and then we'll talk about your previous research. Before we take this break, though, I, I did want to get into the fact, as you allude to, um, also have players that are SGA, that tend to be presidents. Yeah. <laughs> the SGA presidents are the council and stuff like that, and you just don't see that. Um, just last year, Texas Southern University had uh, a top two, some Kulati, Kulati in terms of uh, were athletes, happened to be athletes. Yeah. And he made a comment that he thought maybe Texas Southern was one of the first to do it, certainly across the board. And he was with another athletic director, and they were sharing, and she was saying, yeah, two years ago we had one that was some Kalati. And so it was across that space, and both of them were yeah. excited to hear that news. Uh, but fascinating when you break it down like that. Man, I'm so glad people had a chance to see this. It's going to juxtapose against number five. So we'll come back after this break, get into number five, We'll get ready to close up and ask the final component of your research, and we'll be able to get out of here uh, for the show today. Stick with us after this last break. We'll come back on the other side, close out on some things. He and Charles is and then associates. And then we'll close. It's a sophisticated and experienced law firm located in your neighborhood. We're turning injury to cash. T. Madden and associates obtained almost two million dollars for my injury. They turned my injury to cash. Now. We can't guarantee how much your injury is worth, but we've recovered millions for our clients. Call T. Madden & Associates at 833-PAID-123. That's 833-PAID-123. This is Ryan Fulford. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. Stride K-12 powered schools are ready to put over 20 years of being a leader in online education to work for you. Dive into curriculum design for the online classroom. Team up with state-certified teachers nice. trained in virtual instruction. Take control of your child's education journey. Discover the power of personalized learning with a leader experienced in preparing kids for a future they can be excited about. Take charge. Stride K-12. Enroll now for the fall. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team if they want a lot. Yeah, and who the ball, ball, ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir, Yes Sir, and pay attention because he gon' teach a lesson. This is Doctor Cavill's Inside the HP Sports Lab. We're talking about you gotta be there. A thematic content analysis of historically black college and university sporting experience, and that is with Doctor. Save on Foster. We're into our last thematic approach that came out was the Black Oppressive Nightmare. And I said it was juxtaposed in a lot of ways to number four, but really the first four. But as we come to a close, talk a little bit about the Black Oppressive Nightmare. What did you mean and what came out in terms of that thematic frame? Yeah, so uh, first I felt like it would have been irresponsible to not address the fact that you know, HBCUs historically have been underfunded and they've been they've been under attack by many of their states. Socially, we've seen the discourse go through its ebbs and flows. And I mean, even now, people are question, questioning the, the validity or purpose of HBCUs. And, you know, even look, specifically looking at sport, seeing how HBCU athletes have been devalued when Dion took the job at Jackson State a lot of the negative attitudes kind of surrounding that. And then when he left Jackson State, those attitudes again kind of resurfaced. And even now that he left, because now he's HBCU adjacent, he basically has a target on his back where people are like, oh, you know, are you really good enough to coach at this level? So again, we start like, we know that it's here. We know that it's existing. But essentially, this is where people were talking about some of the challenges that they know 
the HBCUs and at their athletic spaces that they that they uh, that they face. Students were some of the tweets talked about how HBCUs were unfairly ranked in comparison to other programs when it came to March Madness. Um, in a previous paper, I actually looked at some of the statistics and some of the odds. And we had HBCUs that had better records than Power Five programs, both both in total and within their conference, but they were ranked lower. So when we're looking at like strength of schedule and things like that, that's a very unfair metric that, you know, again, because HBCU conferences are already devalued in terms of the media and how people assess, then that create creates this larger issue. We're looking at how media members, uh, how they talk about how they frame HBCUs. They pe- People notice the difference in uh, knowledge and expertise that people would have, you know, just when it came to filling the air, when it came to, you know, sport, being a sports commentator, talking about, you know, uh, Alabama versus A&M game, but then when Jackson State and Southern, when they're on TV and, you know, they're trying to fill the air, you know, very surface level, very like minimal information that they're using. Um, the bands not being showcased when that's a huge component, you know, people not re- like the same level of effort. And one of the things that also stuck out was uh, just looking at the expectations, I believe with ESPN now, uh, the streaming, the streaming responsibility is now on the institution, but there's nothing to fix the gap between institutions in terms of making sure that the stream goes through successfully. So when you're looking at HBCUs that may be in a more rural area where, you know, having the necessary resources and technology to make sure that stream goes through well, you know, ESPN, the technology, the resources, local news stations, technology and resources that could be used as a buffer doesn't exist. But then you look at some of these, uh, you know, historically white colleges and universities, they're getting additional support. They're, you know, getting some of these things. So again, we start to see how, all these things that have kind of been structurally pit, uh, structurally set against HBCs, we see how that basically hurts us within the athletic space. But the main thing is really just looking at how people from the general public, how they would negatively frame HBCUs and, you know, students having to deal with that, fans having to deal with that. You know, you're out, you're rocking, you know, a shirt from your institution or institution you support. And, you know, people look at you sideways and make a joke like, oh, you know, you may have went you know, eight and two, but that doesn't matter. You're at an HBCU, eight and two there is different than eight and two somewhere else. So, you know, those types of things. Good stuff. Charles, did you have a pause there that you want no, to No, no, that was actually, yeah, that, uh, he, you, you touched on uh, exactly what it was I was looking at with regards to uh, the, the number five, because I was curious about the Black Oppressive Nightmare uh, thematic framework that you had used. So uh, that was an excellent explanation of that. Thank you, thank you. With that, as we get ready to close, um, talk about some of your other research. Maybe people are interested yet blacklisted the college sports landscape, HBCUs, and the theory racialized organizations, uh, published in the Journal of Intercollegiate Sports. Uh, another good one is uh, that was 2022 as well as in 2022. You had the different world, the black crit reconceptualization of HBCU athletics, sociology of sports journal. There's an, and several other ones, but I know that you're about to do uh, another study this fall. Talk a little bit about that, uh, and then uh, we'll give it a close uh, with your framework on what's next for Dr. Yeah. Foster. Yeah, so uh, I'm currently working on a project, submitting the paperwork and everything now, but I'll be bouncing around to a couple different HBCUs across the country. I'm going to have a couple homecomings, a couple big games, and just regular regular season football games. And I want to look at the tailgate experience. Uh, sport management literature overall really doesn't talk about the tailgate experience. But I also I know that post-COVID, um, things are different now. So how how do HBCs, how they maintain this culture and tradition? Because, you know, I get on Instagram, I have friends that are a little bit at quite a few different institutions. And I see that there's still this culture and identity of maintaining like what existed while I was in school. So I was at Winston from 2012 to 2016. You know, being able to go back and still see videos of people at the tailgates or, you know, people coming together, doing a pregame, things like that, you know, that really sticks out. And I know there was, um, especially during COVID and like right after where people were still a little shaky, the tailgate experience was probably something that people leaned to a little more than, you know, being in a stadium or being in an arena because you could create a little more space in that environment, you know, bounce from area to area or, you know, just kind of have a different approach to it. But I'm just really looking at how do you maintain tradition? How do you maintain identity? How do you maintain identity and culture 
after a very rocky two year period of limited interaction or, you know, limited uh, opportunity to be around each other. So just kind of seeing like what this new generation, what this new wave of HBCU students are doing to maintain what kind of has been built from generations before. Man, I love it. Want to be supportive of that. Hopefully you have a chance to meet be a part of that as well. But we're here talking to Dr. Savon Foster, uh, whose research in many areas, but specifically of late HBCU athletics, as you've heard today, college sports culture, college athletic experience and development uh, in terms of some of the things that he's researching at this time. Thank you for listening to Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Coville, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from Inside the Lab in the College of HBC Sports. Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, up on our time, and our guest, Dr. Savon Foster. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bill's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock. We look forward to next week as we discuss the latest news in the lab. We'll bring you updates. We will have a show, live show tomorrow uh, here in Norfolk for the MEAC Media Football Day, and that will be at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So those in Central, that's 10 o'clock. Check us out. We well, should be able to give you a full hour of what it looks like there. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-G-A-C-A-V-I-L. Make sure you check out our other programs on BCSN. Download my JVN, my BCSN. We will be in uh, Birmingham next Tuesday for the SWAC Media Day. Um, so check us out on our next two episodes, which will be live. One here in Norfolk for the MEAC Media Day, and then on Tuesday in Birmingham, Alabama for the SWAC Media Day. Dream Day, continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Charles? Horse. Lecture. Lavon? Lecture. Dismissed.